What we're trudging ahead with this morning is a word that I learned um, several weeks ago. And as I studied it, 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 it became a part of what I've realized I needed to change. And that word was ethos. All right, so we're going to study the word ethos this morning. But more importantly, we're going to be talking about grace. And so the sociological definition, so I had to teach myself what sociological meant. It means just what normal people think the word means. So this is the fundamental character or spirit of a culture. The underlying sentiment that informs the beliefs, customs, or practice of a group or society. It's the dominant assumptions of people. So when we talk about this this morning, not only do I want you to think about journey by grace as a culture, but also what customs or habits, or let's, let's call that the ethos, is in my life and what's pouring out of it. All right, so to, to hone this in a little bit, what do you expect walking through that door? Should I be in jeans preaching a sermon? Because I really want to be. Is that allowed? Should I have a lid on my coffee cup? God forbid a stain hits the floor, huh? Because you guys don't spill stuff at your house. Do I have to dress up to come to church? Does the person sitting next to me have to act like me? What are your thoughts coming into the building? But also... Do people know you're a Christian by the way you drive your buggy in Walmart? (laughs) Or down 51. If you followed me, you'd be like, how'd that dude get ordained? (laughs) That's why I don't have a Jesus fish sticker on my car. (laughs) It'll never happen. And so when we look at the ethos of our lives, we want to look at the dominant assumptions of the people. Webster defines it as this. Ethos means customer character in Greek. As originally used by Aristotle, Aristotle used three words to define language. Pathos, logos, and ethos. Pathos, the mood. Logos is the words. Ethos is the culture. It refers to a man's character or personality, especially in balance between passion and caution. The biblical definition, we should probably use the Bible. It means literally a custom or a usage prescribed by law an institute a prescription or a writ. So when you see this in Scripture, Acts 6, 13, and 14 is a good example. I'm going to start in verse 14. For we, we have heard him say that this Nazarene Jesus will destroy this place and what? Alter the customs, God forbid, you're going to change what we do, which Moses handed down to us. So Jesus is going to mess up our ethos. Do we like this? No. So kill him. So that's the mood of Acts 6 there. John 19, 39 and 40. Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds weight. So this is um, Nicodemus coming to the body of Jesus after he had died. So they took the body of Jesus and brought it in linen wrappings with spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. So the idea of the Jewish culture, this is what their ethos was if you died. That's just showing you a picture of ethos. Hebrews 23, I'm going to actually start in verse 25 there. It says, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is, now we have the word habit of some. So what habits are in your life that are forming your ethos? So is it coming to church weekly? Do you have to become the church every week to be a Christian? That's another sermon. But encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And then lastly, in 1 Corinthians 15, 33 and 34, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Bad company corrupts good morals. A bad ethos will corrupt a good ethos, right? So that idea of culture, what we're outpouring from our life, and and really, I'm not really going to pick on you this morning per se, because I honestly think we're doing a really good job at Journey by Grace. I think our ethos is healthy. I think we complain a lot. I think we use opinions as convictions and say that's God. But every church does, right? So don't beat up on yourself too bad. I think we're doing okay. But what I want to challenge is where can we grow? Right? So do I need to expect the person sitting next to me not to swear while they're sitting there? You're like, Josh. 
Yeah, but if they don't know our rules, how do they know what they should do? Maybe they don't know God yet. And maybe they don't understand grace yet. And so maybe they're just being them. I'd prefer that. I'd prefer you not put a mask on when you come here and act like you're better than me. That's what I'd prefer. It doesn't mean that always happens. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm not picking on you. I'm just giving you food for thought. So let me give you my view. This is what, what I, my view of ethos would be. Ethos could be described as the character or disposition or mood or even the air of a church community. The ethos or custom of a church is directly related to the custom of the people. The ethos or custom of a church is directly related to the custom of the people. A church is nothing without you. Well, God. Okay, let's start there. Without God, I'm out of a job and we shouldn't be here. But then the church is made up of you. And their understanding of two very important things, grace and truth, flowing out of their lives. Thus influencing the entire atmosphere of our lives. Our local church and our ministries that each Christian is called to do. Did you know that each one of you has your own ministry that you should be doing? That's another sermon too. Once we understand fully the idea of grace and discover our spiritual gifts, then we will start to see the custom and habits of our lives change to greatly impact others for Christ. That's the goal, right? We want what we do to influence those who don't know him so they know him. It's not necessarily to fill the empty seat next to you, all that be great, but I really want your lives. Do people know God by looking at you? You don't need to talk. You don't need to do anything. But by you walking in Walmart, are people like, hey, that guy's a Christian. He didn't ram me with his cart. So Christians today spend an enormous amount of energy debating and declaring truth. Every church defends its particular version of the Bible. But what about grace? You probably don't know too many churches trying to out-grace each other. And yet it's grace that is our best gift to the world. The world can do almost anything as well or better than the church. Hear this. You don't need to be a Christian to build a house, feed the hungry, or heal the sick. There is only one thing the world cannot do. It cannot offer grace. The only proof you have to the world who's living in a system that can do everything as good as we can do is grace. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. There are five different types of grace that I'm going to go over. And then I'm going to go over seven different ways this is going to play out in your, net, your life. Those numbers equal to not as much time as your head just told you this is going to take. Because <laughs> all of you just did really quick math. And you're like, I, oh God. I promise you it won't be as long as your head's telling you. Five different types of grace. The first one should, these are all active in a, in a believer's life if you know God. The first one is saving grace. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace you have been saved through what you did. No, through faith. And that is not of yourselves, it is a gift. You didn't earn it, of God. Not as a result of what you did, so that no one may boast. It's not you, it's God that gives you grace. Number two, Grace that lives victoriously in one's daily life. I preached a sermon here, I don't know when, I asked if you could stop sinning for a day. And y'all were like, mm, mm And I went, oh, are you that bad of people? And y'all did that, like the, oh. Because the God I know allows me to live victoriously. Yes, through him. Yes, in his power. Yes, in his ability, not my own, because every day I want to defy what God is. But you have a grace working in your life that allows you to live victoriously. Romans 5, 17. I'm going to read the NLT version because I like the way it sounds better. For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. For all who received it will live in defeat. No, triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. You have a grace to live victoriously. Number three, what I call logistical grace support. God gives you the ability to fail when we work in him because of grace. I promise you, you want to mess up a church more, serve where you're not called to be. You want to mess up this building more, ask me to work in my youth room when you hate teens. I need servants, not lawsuits. Because you're going to end up beating somebody and I don't need that. 
right? Like if you're like, I'm not called to work with kids, don't work with kids. No one's telling you to. Just don't. That's fine. But it doesn't give you an excuse just to sit there and not do anything. You have a grace support that allows you to, hey, man, I think I'm good at serving. So I'm going to help with funeral dinners or I'm going to water plants because no one cares to water a plant around here. I only care about the plants in my office. I don't care about anyone else's. So they don't ever get watered. So if you like to water plants, have at it. There's something grace gives you that you can do. 2 Corinthians 9, 8, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that you always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. There's a grace to be experienced in eternity. I had a, had a question after first service about this. Yes, you are sanctified now. You don't get a sanctified body till you're in heaven. So there's sanctifying grace, which sets you apart. That's justification. Sanctifying cleanses you to stand before God. Those are two fun, big Christian words. But all it really means is grace gives you the ability to stand in front of God as his child and him to say to you, I love you. That's what grace does for your life. And so... Ephesians 2.17, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Lastly, dying grace. So when we die, as Christians, it's like falling asleep. There's not a threat in death because there's an active grace called dying grace. Psalm 23.4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So as a Christian and dying in death, there's no need to fret leaving this world because it's not your home anyway. And so actively working in every Christian's life, there's saving grace, sanctifying grace, dying grace, logistical support grace, and one that I'm forgetting right now. The serving one that allows you to serve God. That's why I have notes. So those five are working in you. You're thinking to yourself, man, didn't you do this once already? <laughs> you have those five working in you all the time. So let me define it for you. Grace is all that God is now free to do for us because of what Jesus accomplished in our behalf on the cross. Grace is the undeserved, unmerited favor or blessing of God. And grace means that our salvation starts with God. He is the one who takes the initiative. Everywhere grace is in Scripture, it's a dominant word. It's a pounding word that takes over. Grace is not this babying idea that I'm going to let you walk all over me and then somehow let you forgive me and then you're going to get to do that again. What grace is, is it comes in, changes your perspective, and fixes your mess. And puts the focus off of you and on the Jesus Christ, who ultimately is the author and perfecter of your faith in the first place. And if you did nothing to earn it, why are we requiring others to earn it? I have to get right before I talk to God. No! Show me that in Scripture. It's just not true. You don't need this repentive prayer before you get to God. God's ready and going, hey, here I am. What it took you so long to realize where I was? And we get so focused on our own sin that we forget that there's grace. And then what happens is we look at everyone else through those eyes and we hold them to a standard I'm not living in. And then our ethos gets completely messed up. Our habits, our customs, where we go, what we're saying, completely messed up. Because we forgot that grace is a free gift. Number one in the seven things. Told you the five went quick, didn't it? Number one. Under grace, God is always the giver in our relationship with him, and we are always the receiver. The end result is that God is always glorified. When we're talking about grace, it's never you. So when you do something at church, I don't care that you did it, but God does. All right, I know that's like really harsh, right? Like, Josh. But honestly, man, I, I, don't, I don't need to know. I don't think anybody else needs to know. So if you want to stand up and shout, why am I not being appreciated? Yes, there's room for appreciation. But are you trying to get recognition or are you trying to serve God because that's what you were called to do? Because God's glorified, not you. And so that's, that's what I want to... I don't see that here. By the way, this isn't like a picking sermon. Again, I don't see it here. I think we have really good people. I think we do really good work here. I think we have a good custom when you walk in this room. 
one day I'm going to preach in jeans. I'm just not there yet. <laughs> one day you won't judge me. But I think, I think we are doing a good job. I really do. Number, uh, so 1 Peter 4.11. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strengths which God supplies, not you. So that in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Matthew 5, 16 says, In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise you now. Will praise your heavenly Father. Grace means we owe everything to God. If you notice when I pray for the offering, I pray the same prayer every time I pray. God, thank you for giving it to us. Help us to give it back to you. Grace understands that everything that I think I've built, God allowed me to do it. If you weren't supposed to have what you have, you wouldn't have it. Grace says, you're my kid. I'm going to allow you to succeed. And maybe you're sitting there defeated going, well, I don't have anything. Have you stopped trying yet and asked God to help? Or are you focused on you? That's because grace understands that God just wants to give me because I'm his child. Grace is what we get when someone owes you nothing. Grace must always be free for the taking or it isn't grace. You can't put a restriction on something and then say, well, I give you grace. That is the most backwards thing in the world. That's legalism wrapped in nice. I don't even really know what that is. But you can't, well, you can't swear in church. You you have to look nice. And um, don't drink the coffee. And make sure you don't bring it in the sanctuary without a lid or you will get yelled at. Don't bring the donut in here. No, you can't have the donut in here. No. No. You cannot have open feet. Put shoes on. Sandals, no. One day I'm going to preach in shorts, sandals, and a t-shirt. Then I'll just mess you all up. I pick because it's, it's easy. But do we look at people that walk in here and they don't have the nicest clothes on and go, or are we just saying, hey, man, welcome. We're glad you're here. You know, I, I got young adults that come into my house and they're, they're sitting on my couch swearing. I'm like, whoa, dude. I'm like, let's not do that. You know, like they don't know any better, though. I love it. Like they have no idea. Like one of my young adults, I'll share this story with you, and you're, you're going to have a shock face, so you have to give me grace, all right? And don't tell Pastor Bill, even though his wife's here, don't tell Sherry either. I have a young adult who brings a friend to church, and he's like, I'm just trying to get him to stop swearing in church. I love that, because that guy is getting it. He's getting the truth while he's sitting here. You don't have to be perfect to sit in a chair. And man, I hate when we have people that walk in the churches or youth groups or young adults or your Bible studies and maybe they don't smell the best, maybe they don't look the best, but the ultimate goal is your life reaching them, right? So that's not what the ethos we want as a church, man. We, we want you. Cleanliness is next to godliness. That's such a lie. You can be dirty and love Jesus. I don't even know where that comes from. Like, come on. Let's, let's understand grace and let's understand this idea that they need God just as much as I do. If grace is free and undeserved, then the only way to experience it is on the basis of faith alone, or Romans 11, 6. But if by grace it is no longer on the basis of works, otherwise grace is no longer grace. That was biblical. I said that before. Romans 4, 4, and 5. When people work, their wages are not a gift, but something they have earned. But people are counted as righteous, not because of their work, but the work of God is what that's supposed to say. I forgot to fix it but God's work in your life. You didn't earn what you have, so let's not make other people earn it too. Romans 4, 16, for this reason it is by faith in order that it may be in accordance with grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also because of their faith in God, who forgives sinners to those who are of faith in Abraham, who is the father of us all. Five, grace enables us to serve God without constant fear. Thank God. There is a lie in the church that says you have to do to earn. 
I don't understand that because, again, if you're not called to work with kids, please stop. I'm just picking on it because it's easy because no one really likes kids, let's be honest. <laughs> just, there's not a lot of calling on a lot of people's lives. The youth isn't either, I understand that. But there isn't a fear. When you're under grace, God's giving you what he gave you, not because you earned it or not because you have to keep it or not because you have to continue to serve him to make things better. It's only because God wanted to give it to you. So why do you have to keep doing something to get it? There is never a fear that, did I do enough? Grace says, yep, because Jesus did the most. That's the idea of grace. Number six, the major opponent or obstacle to the ongoing experience of our receiving God's grace is when Christians revert to a performance-based lifestyle which is a form of legalism. All legalism is, is your opinion is better than God's. You can't find me in the scripture where I can't stand here in jeans. That may be your conviction, and convictions are good. So like when you drink alcohol and you're like, I feel bad about that, stop. That's a conviction from God. That's a good thing. But your conviction of I have to look good to come in here is an opinion. Or I've served here for 20 years and what I want isn't being done, so my opinion is that it's wrong. Well, that's great, but again, that's your opinion. That's not necessarily grace at all. Grace says, even though I don't agree, I will follow. Trust is, okay, I don't necessarily know what's going on, and I see a lot of mess, but I trust that they have a handle on it. That's grace. Does that make sense? Because this happens in our families. This doesn't just happen in church, right? Like your parents will make some weird decision. and you're Like as adults, you're like, that shouldn't. No. I know more than you. And we, we, we get this mixed up. So even though we don't agree, grace lets you follow. And number seven, the beauty of God's grace is that it always glorifies God. Romans 6.14, sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. 2 Timothy 2.1 For you, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15.10 But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain. But I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Hebrews 12.15 See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. We should be spurring people on into doing something for God. You got that abnormally happy person? You're like, why are you abnormally happy all the time? Maybe you should be a greeter. We would like you to be happy when people walk into our church. That's a good idea, right? We don't want some person like bawling standing at the door. That sends a bad message, right? Like new to the church and this girl's already crying. I ain't even in the door yet. You want people to be happy. Right, So use what the grace God's given you and serve in that so that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble and by it many be defiled. Isaiah 30, 18. Therefore the Lord longs to be gracious to you. He, he longs to be gracious. He's not up there waiting for you to get better, waiting for you to find out what that sin is so you can repent of it and talk to him. He's longing to be gracious to you and therefore he waits on high to have compassion on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. How blessed are all those who long back for him. The idea of this grace is is something, when when I first formed this sermon and this ethos idea, I had to go and and repent to my daughter because I realized the ethos I was creating in my house wasn't something that was grace. And so when we look at this, there's some enemies we have of grace, or I'm going to call a healthy custom, because I think a grace attitude is a healthy custom. Number one is human pride. We never want to admit that I deserve the attitude. We never want to admit we're wrong. The I deserve it attitude. Well, I gave all that money, so I deserve this. No. How did you, like, why did you even give it in the first place then? Or if I'm working and I... I The I deserve this. The human good, I'm good enough. Yeah, no, you're not. The Bible's very clear about that. You're not good. God is. And legalism, again, your opinion matters more than God's. 
Like, that's a big one. That one cripples churches. So, my summary. The understanding of God's grace creates a high-commitment church body as opposed to a low-commitment church. The assumption is that a healthy custom is a life that is attractive to unbelievers and a life that is spirit-saturated. So if you want to know you're there, you're like, all right, Josh, I understand. I've heard grace. Again, it's in our name. Bill preaches on it every week. Good Lord, dude, really? Let me give you some good factors of am I there yet? The desire and hunger for truth is always there. You're desiring to learn about the truth of God. Number two, your time is freely given. Your understanding that I need to serve. And I'm not saying that we don't have servants here. This isn't a sign up in the lobby to serve today. No. Because again, I don't want you to serve where you don't want to be. Like that is silly. Please don't jump into something because you're fearful of it, but you know you're in a healthy place. And you're like, you know what? God won't be quiet about this and I need to do this. You're desiring to be equipped for ministry. You're actually figuring out your spiritual gifts and you're coming to us going, hey, God gave me this. I want to do this. Great, let's do it. And, and secondly, your money is where your mouth is. That's all high giving level means. Is your money following what God gave you? God gave it to you. Are you giving it back? Your money is where your mouth is. I want to read you a story that kind of sums up the idea of grace in a healthy life. And then Tom's going to lead us in communion. But there was a service at a rescue mission in a Midwestern city a few years ago. It was a service for children in which children were putting on a play. One little boy was to give a reading. He was only about five or six years old, and he had a deformity, a terrible misshapen back. He has a humpback. And this is a true story. As he walked across the stage to give his reading, it was very evident that he was very nervous, very shy and afraid, and very much aware of his condition. In fact, it was the first time that he'd ever tried anything like this, and it was a great struggle for him. Two older fellows had come into the back of the room intending to ridicule the service. One of them called out to the boys who walked across the stage, Hey, son, where are you going with the pack on your back? The little boy was completely demoralized, and he began to cry. He just stood up there and sobbed. A man got up out of the audience and came up to the platform. He knelt down by the little boy. He put his arm around him. He said to the audience, It must take a very callous and cruel person to say something like that to a little boy like this. He is suffering from something that is not his fault at all. He does have this deformity, and despite it, he was trying for the first time to venture out and to say something in public. And now this remark has cut him deeply. But I want you to know that this little boy is mine. That's God's thought. When he looks at you, he doesn't see what messes you up. He doesn't see what you know. This overwhelms me. Because I know how much I mess up. I know how much I'm angry. I'm sarcastic. I belittle people. I know these things about me. And yet God's still sitting there going, yeah, he's mine. I don't think I'll ever understand that. I love him just the way he is. He belongs to me and I'm proud of him. And he led the boy off the platform. God's desire in your life is that you realize that you're his. Grace allows you to understand how bad you are, but how good God is. It's never our effort. It's never our ability that gets us anywhere. And if that's your root idea that I need to work to earn, I, I don't want to be you. Because you're never going to get there. You're never going to be able to work hard enough to earn the enormous gift of salvation. There's so many Christians live 20 years regretfully walking a Christian life because all they feel like is I have to do, 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 do. And we serve, 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 and we just crush churches because we're mad. Because all of a sudden, I don't understand why everything's going wrong. The reality is you just need to sit there, shut up and listen and understand that God's grace is what is effective in your life and not your ability. And when we look at others, we apply the same standard. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the idea of grace and 
Thank you so much for your ability in our lives. God, without you, we are nothing. Without you, we're dead in the water. And so, God, I just ask that grace would just flow in hearts and minds today. That, God, we understand the enormous gift and we apply that rightly in a healthy habit and custom in our lives. God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for your gift. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.